my name is Abahi and I am going to go over some foundational insurance terms to help you with the property and casualty adjuster insurance exam. This should be able to be broad enough to apply to whichever state you are in. So without further delay, let's get started. All right, so these are the definitions that we are going to go over. Now, most of you may have a good general knowledge about insurance, but if you don't, we are going to start with the basics. Going from insurance, insurer, uh, the insured premium policy, risk, hazard, peril, and lost. You will also be, well, you'll also have some uh, pop quizzes to test your knowledge along the way and to make sure that uh, you're grasping the concepts or the definitions. All right, let's go. Let's, let's hit these buttons down here. All right. Uh, oh, before I forget, a good general tip for those of you who maybe have taken the exam and didn't pass like I did because I failed my first test. Practice, practice, practice as much as possible. So I created a place for adjusters or soon to be adjusters to practice just head to majoradjusters.com slash free dash practice dash test that will give you a great example of the actual test and I don't know of too many places on the web that allow you to do a practice test for free so I went ahead and created at least one. If there are others, please mention in the comments below so that we can all share that knowledge and information. If you do have any questions, I put my number up there for you. I may not be able to answer right away. I may be with a homeowner because I do uh, mediate between homeowners and insurance companies. But uh, feel free to send me an email and I'll be able to get back to you um, promptly. All right, so let's go get into it. So the first question is, what is insurance? All right. Um, if you take a look at the picture in the background, you can see them pretty much passing the bomb. That's the bomb. I want to say passing the buck or passing the hot potato. That's essentially what insurance is. It's a financial tool that protects individuals and organizations from unforeseen and extraordinary financial loss by transferring the risk to another party. So transferring is passing that hot potato. So instead of you holding all the risks when you get into a car accident, having to pay for injuries, having to pay for repairs, you are able to transfer that risk to another party. That party is going to be your insurance company, but you have to purchase an insurance policy to be able to do that. And then the insurer provides financial protection to the insured so that you won't have to come out of pocket for an extreme amount. And that's what you exchange for your policy premium. Excuse me, just taking a good drink of water there. So let's go on to the next term. Insure versus insured. Again, the test is really not going to use the term insurance company. They are going to use the term insure. And the insurer is a party who agrees to compensate people, companies, or other organizations for specific financial losses. Don't forget that companies and organizations, nonprofits, foundations, and companies also need insurance. Even insurance companies have insurance. Those are called reinsurance, but we'll get to that in a different video. Right now, we'll stick to the basic terms. The insured is the personal organization, 
you can also put company there, that would receive payment from the insurance company if a particular event happens. It's not going to cover every event. It's also not going to give you a payment if nothing happens. There has to be a certain defined event that is usually going to be sudden and accidental that will cause the insurer to give payment to the insured. And you can see that um, I have uh, just pictures and examples for you too. I'm, I'm a visual person, a visual learner, so hopefully these visuals help really seal in the concepts, knowledge, and information. Okay, I mentioned insurance premium. You have to pay your premium on a regular or consistent basis to be able to have and maintain an active insurance policy. They don't call the premium a payment. Why? Because as you see, I put it's just a good old sales tactic. And premium sounds better than payment. Because one reason for that may also be that they don't want the payment to, um, to seem as though this is a profit for the insurance company. Your premium gets pooled with all the other policyholder premiums and goes a portion of it goes into a reserve fund. That reserve fund is then used to pay out policyholders when an incident does occur. So when someone makes a claim, the insurance company pays that amount out of that reserve fund. So your payments aren't like your cell phone payments payment that goes to the company and gets distributed. In fact, it's actually getting pooled and being shared among the other policyholders. Next is your insurance policy. If you own a car, you have seen this policy. If you own a car or house, or maybe you even have renter's insurance, you have seen this document. This first page is called a deck page, which we'll get into in a bit. But the insurance policy is a contract of insurance. This means that it is, um, it's a contract between the insurer and the insured, the policyholder, or the person who pays the premium, and it details the terms and conditions of a contract of insurance, which determines the claims the insurer is legally required to pay. In exchange for an initial payment known as a premium. So again, you have to give that payment up front to be able to have coverage. All right, so let's keep moving on. Pop quiz. All right, a contract which is legal and binding where the risk of financial loss is transferred in exchange for premiums is called five, four, three, two, one, an insurance policy. So that's the contract. The contract, the insurance policy is a contract between the insured and the insurer. Next question. Which of the following best describes insurer? Is it transfer of risk, a financial loss from one party to the other, a legal binding contract in which the insurance company agrees to pay for losses in exchange for premiums? Is it a company or group? or government agency offering financial protection? Or could it be D, an individual organization that pays premiums in exchange for protection? All 
Okay, so your answer is going to be C. A company, group, or government agency offering financial protection. Government agency that does offer financial protection is going to be FEMA. They are the um, only policies for flood that are available. Your carrier will offer them to you, but they're only being offered through the National Flood Insurance Program, which is um, organized and um, managed by FEMA. To have a change in that flood policy, you, it takes an act of Congress. It's very high up there. Okay, so let's get to what the um, parts of the insurance policy. Now, what I did to help you remember is I gave you an acronym. Now, it's, it's kind of like DICE, D. It's also, you could say DECIDE, however it's spelled wrong. I don't recall, but on the test, um, excuse me, I don't recall if on the test it asks you for the parts of the policy in order. It may, however, ask you about the first page or the front page, which is known as the deck page. So I didn't want to reorder the acronym. So hopefully DICE, D, helps you or just think decided. Just, however, know that the spelling is different from the actual uh, English word decided or decide. This is your deck page. It houses your name, address, the policy period for however many months, the location of the premises, your policy limits. For example, in the most states, the auto limits, I believe, are like twenty-five fifty. Um, and then, if you depending on what state you are in, it may be ten fifteen. And we're talking about thousands of dollars here. So that's when it, it says the policy. So the limits are how much the insurance company will pay, like the max, the maximum the insurance company will pay. This declarations page is also known as the deck or deck page. Next is your insuring agreement. This is really what the more of contract language it is letting the policyholder know what the insurer is going to insure so as you see in the box highlighted it talks about what they will pay for and this is really the contract language and, and, and why it's more of a contract than just um, in a uh, what's well, an agreement too as well so just remember that the insuring agreement follows the deck page and this determines what will be paid for now there are conditions to this agreement now, for example, a condition would be if you are an Uber or Lyft driver, most basic auto policies will not pay for incidents that are involved when your automobile is being used as a livery or delivery service. That means if you deliver pizzas, you work for Postmates, Uber Eats, Grubhub, delivering food or you're delivering people as a livery cab that's what they call that something I didn't know until I moved to Chicago but it's called the livery cab um, and so as an uber driver you are delivering individuals from one location to another those are your con some of the conditions other conditions would be drunk driving if you are operating your vehicle in a manner that is not intended. It's not intended to be operated. You are also going to um, not be able to be paid out for any claims that you make under uh, while you were drunk driving your vehicle. 
The conditions page also gives information about how to cancel your policy. It also determines if you try to conceal something. So a concealment example may be if you have four drivers in the home, two of them are under the age of 18, but you only tell your insurance company that there's one driver, one licensed driver in the home. That would be concealment. Or you don't make them aware that the other, the drivers under 18 have their license. That would be concealment as well. So look, if you have a policy, take a look and read through it. It's, it's great knowledge for you to know because this is, you are going to be, need to be able to deliver the language to policyholders when you're working as an adjuster inside or outside, car or home. Now, exclusions are what the insurance company will not cover. Flood or water that seeps in from the ground would not be considered, or would, I'm sorry, excuse me, would be considered an exclusion. They make, they will cover water that seeps in above ground, for example, through your roof. Now, if you have flood policy, that's a different story. Most homes don't have flood policies, even when they live by the beach. There's different reasons why is not every home can be insured because they don't meet certain conditions determined by FEMA. So as you see, these are just a couple examples of exclusions. If you wanted to have earth movement, so like an earthquake or a mudslide. If you wanted to have those covered in your policy, you'll need to add an endorsement to that. An endorsement is going to raise your premium, but you do have that coverage. So it's a give and take situation. Now let's look at some definitions or at least what the definitions part of your policy means. This is going to just really determine um, or really define the language with inside the insurance policy. As you see, insured talks about you or yours. That's the first party. The insurer is going to be the we or us. There's also a third party where maybe you hit somebody in the accident that will be the third party and they're going to go through your insurance company. So the language there may be they or their, as in their car. You also have uh, definitions like deductible and dependent because with the home, anyone who is living in your house, almost anyone living in your house can be covered under your insurance policy. So your kids, um, some relatives may be covered just uh, depends on who the relative is. Friends who are living in your home won't, wouldn't be considered a dependent. And they also say up to a certain age. So after 27, there wouldn't be a dependent, but they still may be covered um, in certain ways, especially with your auto policy. Because your auto policy really covers the car, not the, not the person insured, covers the car more. That to the because somebody could drive your car, hit somebody and your policy would still take care of that. But if it's if they're driving it on a regular basis, the insurance company may say, well, you concealed that information from us and we're not going to cover it. So you have to be very careful when you are lending your car or bringing somebody in your home when it comes to dealing with your insurance company. Or just be very careful when you're making those claims and using the right terms and just being very specific about what happened in the incident. All right, last but not least on the parts of the policy is going to be the endorsements. Again, I mentioned that with the earthquake or, or flood. Actually, flood wouldn't be an endorsement. It would be its own policy. So an endorsement is really just adding additional coverage for an additional charge. 
you see in this example here, but you can buy a special endorsement for food spoilage caused by a power outage. Now, between 15 to 50 bucks per year really isn't that bad, especially if it's around Christmas time and you just you got your ham, your turkey, several side dishes that you just spent two to three hundred bucks on and um lord behold there is a snowstorm and the power is out three days like it was here in georgia last year now if we had that food spoilage uh clause we may be able to redeem our um redeem that the money that we paid for that food however it's going to really depend on that deductible how much do they want is it going to be a 500 dollars deductible then you know, you really wouldn't need to go ahead and do that because you might as well just get the food instead of paying the deductible. It just really depends because there could be other things that are entwined. Maybe your house flooded. And so then that deductible, if you're paying $500, you can also include your food. It's not that much extra. It's not going to be any more extra for you out of pocket. So it's really it depends upon your situation. Now, pop quiz. I'm going to let you read this while I take a drink of water. All right. So, which of the following best describes insurance? I hope you all got your answer. And if I'm going too fast, just let me know in the comments and on the next video that I do, I'll just slow it down a little bit. All right. And if I'm going too slow, let me know. Um, I, you know, I've had comments that say, hey, get to the get to the effing point already. And <laughs> I know everybody's short for time. So let's keep it moving. All right. So your answer here is going to be B, an economic device used to protect against the risk of unforeseen and extraordinary financial loss all right insurance risk this is the likelihood that an insured event will occur requiring the insurer to pay a claim so you have two types of risk speculative and pure risk and then when you look at pure risk there's different types of categories but we're going to just stay uh, top level here and just define the difference between speculative and pure risk you can see just on this chart that uh, the event probability and the event impact, the the red area, if it's likely for an event, um, let's say you have an event where there's um, maybe a daredevil and he, I remember, uh, I think it was Evil Knievel. He was going to jump the Grand Canyon. However, it started to snow that day. And the risk of him getting injured went up. He decided instead of to um, accept the risk of getting hurt because now everything is icy. He uh, decided to avoid that risk altogether and jump a different day, which he did. And he made it successfully. When you look at the insurance company, they're going to look at events of if you have a home by the beach and you don't have it on post the likelihood of it flooding during a hurricane is so high because it's right there on the ground level right an insurance company is probably not going to insure that home because the likelihood of them having to pay out a claim is too great insurance is nice but they want to keep their money and they have a lot of it so they've been very smart to, and they have the opportunity and it's all in their power to say, you know what, we are not going to insure that risk. It's too likely that we're going to have to pay that out. Now, if you have it on stilts, if you have that same home by the beach on stilts, they'll look at it and they'll say, you know, it's not too bad uh, because the home, although a flood can happen because it's on these stilts and it's high enough off the ground. We'll go ahead and ensure it. Our risk is not as great as when it was on the ground. Now, let's take a look at the difference again between speculative and pure risk. Just so you know, a speculative risk is not going to be insurable. 
Here's why. Mainly, it's because the possibility of a gain is there. With insurance, you only are able to be indemnified. And what that means is they want to restore you back to before the incident happened. But they don't want you to be better off. Okay. That's one of the reasons why you cannot get a full car replacement. They're getting better about that with the gap insurance. and uh, um, But you pay additional for that. If you look at a situation like gambling and investing in the stock market. Or you can look at also any investment project, maybe um, uh, a building. We want to insure this building going up, um, but we're going to be selling it on the other end. They're probably not going to insure that. They will insure the construction and the labor and um, just while it's going up so that you can be uh, back to normal. But if you're going to make a substantial gain of um we're going to insure this we're they're going to insure the house and or the building and then we're going to profit from it in the end too there, there's not quite the same insurance there's other insurances that they will help you with but there couldn't be you couldn't have the prospect of having a gain and mainly my example may not have been the best but it's mainly like gambling like this horse you know um can you ensure if i lose out my money can i get my money back no because you have the opportunity to gain money so um they're not going to insure speculative risk pure risk they can insure and they will insure there's no possible uh at least in the definition you aren't able to gain in a pure risk examples of a pure risk are fires there's no way if your house burns on um burns down to the ground that you can gain from that situation there's no profit to be made you can only be um a, a set back to where you were before that fire happened All right, pop quiz, and I will let you all take a read at that while I get another drink of water. Okay, so I'm back. This says, which of the following best characterizes a speculative risk? What do we have here? A person who is careless or irresponsible, ensuring the life with a policy that provides double indemnity for accidental death, a situation that offers the possibility of a loss or a gain, or could it be transferring the risk of a loss to another party? C. A situation that offers the possibility of a loss or a gain. All right, let's look at insurance hazards. Now, what is a hazard? A hazard is a condition that increases the chances of a loss occurring. If you see in this little example, you have our friend Tim Jones here. His, his life as a librarian must have gotten a little boring because he decided to become a bullfighter. But being a bullfighter is a great hazard because he can much more easily be hurt as a bullfighter than as a librarian. Yes, bookshelves do topple, but it's not an everyday occurrence. As a bullfighter, while fighting that bull, you're being charged, you're using knives, there's a possibility of you being trampled or punctured, wounding yourself. So that's a hazard. So it's an increase of Tim, our friend Tim Jones, being hurt. So there's four different types of hazard, physical, legal, moral, and morale. Physical, again, just like in the, with our friend Tim Jones, I said that cab, uh, shells, they fall, but they don't fall all the time. If it's loaded properly, 
in our example, a file in the cabinet wouldn't be a hazard or a risk, okay? The hazard is the overloaded top drawer. The risk is the filing cabinet falling on somebody and hurting them. And they may miss work. There could be other things that happen. So physical hazards are also fire. Could be um, machinery. That's why if you work in a warehouse, as I have in the past, there's different harnesses and safety procedures that take place to reduce the chances of someone being hurt. If you also look, you can have um, your roof, if it's covered with a lot of snow, that could be a hazard as well. Your driveway covered in a lot of snow and as it starts to heat up and melt, it becomes icy. That could be a hazard. In some states like Illinois, you have to shovel your sidewalk because otherwise it's a hazard for um, people to be walking and there could be ice underneath the snow. We, and we don't want people to slip and fall. A legal hazard, uh, the likelihood and severity of a loss due to a condition imposed by a legal process that forces the insurer to cover a risk that it would uh, otherwise deem uninsurable. So we do have uh, some examples here. The American legal system motivates many people to bring litigation suits in order to realize the potential lucrative profits in doing so. One of these hazards, if you really look at it, it may be a change. And I use autos a lot, but let's say if you have a recall, there could be potential that at one point cars didn't even have the brake light. At one point, um, cars didn't have the rear view camera. Now it's mandatory for cars to have that brake light in the back. And the uh, I'm not sure about the uh, rear view camera, but it is a feature um, that could potentially be imposed. So if you have a, a car out there and the um, car maker didn't want to put in that um, back brake light, that could be a legal um, hazard. So that would be something that um, uh, that would motivate many people to bring uh, litigation. There could also be right now there's some um, things going on with the picking of a Supreme Court judge and people would um, really look at that as um, reason to, well, you really can't bring um, litigation against them, but um, against that judge. But essentially, it's really just dealing with the, the court system and bringing litigation suits in order to realize the potential lucrative profits in doing so. Um, anything that might prompt a lawsuit involving an insurer can be considered a legal hazard so anything that might prompt a lawsuit involving an insurer insurance companies do get sued all the time too as well because they don't pay out for workers comp or um, other claims so that's why there's always a need for another lawyer right the world can never have enough lawyers all right so you now let's look at morale hazards Really, when you will break down the difference between morale and moral, this hazard is really just based off of like a carelessness or a little bit of the insured's fault that this happened, um, this hazard happened. For example, the other day I was uh, at the grocery store. My aunt was with me. She left her phone in the car. Now, if she left her phone in the car uh, and let's say the property insurance, uh, your homeowner's insurance covers your property, no matter where you are in the world, they may deem that, however, as a, a morale hazard because she was careless in leaving that there for anybody to see and break into the car and my car uh, my insurance company because it was my car may not fix if the windows were broken to get that phone 
due to her um, carelessness. Luckily, the phone did not get stolen. But can you believe 44,000 cars were stolen in 2014 because people left their keys in the car? That's something that would not be insured or paid out by the insurance company because you didn't take it upon yourself to make sure that your car keys were in a safe spot away from thieves. A moral hazard is um, really looking at the situation and not caring that you get into an incident or not preventing the incident from happening because you have insurance. I have another cousin who used to say when we were riding her car, I wish that car would hit me. I need a new car. Well, if that car hits you, you're not necessarily going to get a new car because one insurance companies aren't usually in the business of replacing new cars. There's a lot of depreciation that happens. And uh, unless you have that gap insurance, you're not going to get that new car, a full car replacement. As you see an example, you know, uh, this young lady spilled some wine, but the guy is like, hey, whatever. I got the insurance. It's the same when you rent a car. You might, um, or even if you don't get the car insurance, you might hit more potholes or dirty the car up a little bit more because it's not your car and you're, um, you just don't care. <clears throat> so you, that would be an example of a moral hazard. You're intentionally not preventing an incident from happening or a situation from getting worse because you have the insurance. All right, so we have about three slides left. I know we've been going a little while. Um, I just wanted to, at this point, ask you how I'm doing. <clears throat> this is one of my uh, first, I've given tips before, but really, I'm really just now trying to go through and give definitions and education to help you pass the test. I'm a visual audio I need hands on. I need to hear it, read it, touch it, feel it, smell it essentially to be able to really get the concepts and I just would like to hear from you if this is working for you and you would like to see more let me know by liking commenting um, and subscribing if you are doing this with other people please share it the more you teach the more you learn and that's really why I'm doing this because I really enjoy the insurance industry now I used to hate it because I just didn't see the point in paying premiums when you don't ever use the insurance. But it's it's very it's 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 wild about town when you really do need it and it's it's there for you when you do. All right, so I wanted to come back to more versus morale just to help you be able to remember it. If you can remember the L morale so it's like if you're drunk you kind of act a little careless you have a different type of um attitude you have that li liquid courage so um just remember morale is really more about carelessness so just think that beer or ale and then you have moral if you just remember the ale on the end of that it's a lie it's a cheat it's di dis being dishonest so you could kind of remember that Pinocchio nose as that L there and hopefully that helps really uh, define the difference between moral versus morale and we're talking about hazards there all right so a couple more definitions before we go insurance peril is a specific risk or cause of loss covered by insurance policies uh, such as a fire windstorm flood or theft in the named policy, if it's named, it's covered. If it's not named, it's not covered. These are the different types of coverages available. Personal property, earthquake, condo insurance, lightning. And if you notice, um, well, you have theft up there, but a lot of these perils don't happen often. And that's the wonderful world of insurance and why it makes so much money because they don't have to pay out. They love when no storms are happening and 
they force you to have insurance mortgage companies will force you car companies banks they i mean will force you to insure your home just in case something does happen so it's a it's an industry that's never going away i can not see it going away a fun fact for you when insurance first got started they used to put a plaque over your house okay and if a fire happened at your house and you had that plaque, the fire department would put out the fire. If you did not have that plaque, they wouldn't put out the fire. Now, this was before fire departments were uh, paid through the government. But just imagine, man, you watching your house and your your neighbor's house catches on fire and uh, they have the plaque and you don't and they get theirs put out and you don't. But things have changed. Aren't we glad about that? <clears throat> All right, last one. So a loss. Uh, insurance loss is any injury or damage that the insured uh, suffered because of a covered accident or misfortune. So if you look, um, I just put some uh, information on uh, the percentages of losses. So you have business interruptions that could be from power outages or um, changes, upgrades and, and, and things of that nature that will shut down the business temporarily. Let's see, property and um, workers comp is um, a little lower on the list, especially workers comp, and which is um, actually really interesting because of how many lawyers are out there fighting for workers comp on a daily, daily basis, uh, personal injury and uh, workers comp is, is really what you see those daytime lawyer commercials uh, have and, you know, um, one call that's all you know they got me 3.2 million dollars and it's i mean it's one every so often where they really get those uh those big hitters okay so that's all that we have today um you know just a reminder to um like and subscribe and um if you need a free practice test please go over to majoradjusters.com um i didn't